Hi, this is Jim Colasar on the Williams College campus, and we're meeting today with uh, Adam Falk, who just got inducted as the college's 17th president yesterday. And as advertised, we're here to chat semi-formally about uh, the weekend and about the beginning of his presidency and about questions that some of you have sent in already and can still send in if you want to by going to the college's website, williams.edu, and up in the upper left-hand corner there's a place that says Ask President Falk a Question. Uh, so you can still do that and we can feed that to him uh, as we're talking this afternoon. But this has been a big weekend for you. Tell us a bit about what the experience has been from your end of things. Oh, it, it, was, a one, it was a wonderful weekend and it's, it's really great to have this opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, what I had wanted from the weekend was a celebration of Williams. So it's a, a moment in the life of the college to induct a new president, and I guess it's happened 17 times now. <laughs> but uh, really, as a, it, more than a moment in my life, really, it's a point of transition for the college. And so I wanted us to celebrate the college, and we did that. I wanted us to think about the college, and we did that. I wanted us to look forward to the future, and we did that. So it was just, and the weather was perfect, mm -hmm. and I think everyone who came really, uh, really felt good about Williams. And if there was one thing I would have wanted, that's what I would have wanted. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the actual events. So there was yeah. a student performance jamboree on Friday night that you were at. So can you tell us a bit what that involved? Yeah, so this was a, they do this periodically, the students, is to bring all of the, or many of the student groups together on one stage and have them each do one piece. And there were dance groups and the gospel choir, which was wonderful, and uh, various singing groups and a Latin dance group. And it was uh, a lot of fun. It started at 10.30, which uh, I think for the students was early because yeah. they all afterwards looked like they were going out to <laughs> do something else. For me, my advanced age, a little later. Uh, I both, I went with Karen and we sat up right in the front and um, they had some inauguration themed acts as well. Could you describe some of those? I heard Absolutely. there was a, a Falk the Musical, perhaps? There was, put on by the uh, Mucho Macho Mucau Mar Military Marching Band, yeah. and uh, the Cap and Bells is a grand collaboration. Uh, they had a kind of a step show, and uh, kind of were managed to work my name into that, which was the <laughs> first time that, that that had ever happened in my life. And what was really neat about it, though, was, again, this incredible diversity uh, of, of acts and diversity of student talent, and how Everybody stayed and everybody cheered everybody and uh, just had a, just a wonderfully kind of unifying feel. And it's very hot in Goodrich at that, when you have that many people there. <laughs> so it, that gave it a real kind of smoky mm -hmm. cabaret feeling. And you managed to stay up that late? I managed yeah. to stay up yeah. that late. Yeah. So then Saturday morning, there was first a panel of bicentennial medalists. Can you say something about that? Uh, well, we had uh, a wonderful collection of bicentennial medalists. And in this panel, we had about two hours, and so everybody could talk for about 15 minutes about their work. And the first was Bill Eddy, who uh, gave a very, set of very provocative uh, uh, observations on the boundary between nature and the, and the human world, mm -hmm. and really kind of challenged us to think about uh, what nature is. And he's someone who's, I think, challenged people in their in, in, their, in all of his career in cross continents to, to think about their impact on nature. So it was a very, very interesting set of remarks. And Dan Kleppner talked about his life as a physicist and, and some of the things he accomplished. And uh, there were probably fewer physicists in the audience, but I was one of them. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought that the, it was absolutely fascinating. And of course, Dan is well known as this marvelous explicator of physics for the layman. And Bill Spriggs, uh, who alum we're very proud of, who has worked at the National Urban League and Department of Economics at Howard and now in the Obama administration, you know, talked both about his time at Williams uh, and some of the, the ways in which he feels that Williams has become a really much stronger, more diverse, more interesting mm -hmm. place over the last 30 years. And also about the field of economics and the ways in which he feels it's very important that it be uh, speaking not just to kind of technicalities but to the, the human condition. Then we heard from uh, Joshua Kraft, who has a marvelous contribution to uh, the Boston area Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, founded the Boys and Girls Club of Chelsea and now serves 14,000 youth in Boston. And I think it's the kind of thing that when someone goes and takes Williams education and does that, it's, it's hard to be prouder of anything that anyone would do mm -hmm. than that kind of service. And finally, Camille Utterback, who uh, is an artist, a recent MacArthur Foundation 
uh, Genius Grant winner who showed her work, which is kind of this marvelous forward-looking work which where the viewer comes in and the things that the viewer does in front of the artwork change the artwork. And so it's some combination of computer programming and art. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gave a very compelling, compelling talk about that. Mm -hmm. So taken as a whole, there was this incredible diversity. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So then there's the ceremony itself. There are many other events that day too. But as much as you try to focus attention on the college and not on yourself, at the ceremony itself, at least for the induction part, there is the focus is yeah. on you. And how weird or wonderful was that? Well, it was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my, uh, my wife asked me kind of how it all felt. And what I told her was that up until the moment that I walked in, it felt like the kind of thing I'd done many times. I'd done a lot of commencements in, in my life in academia. And so I thought I was carrying my notebook and, and getting ready to do a commencement was how it felt. And then I, I, I walked in and I suddenly realized what a singular and amazing moment this was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was my first convocation. And so all of it was new to me. But it, it, the warmth of the welcome, I mean, it was just, mm -hmm. just marvelous. So many of the uh, texts and video clips from the induction weekend are going to be on the website soon. People out there should know. And they'll be being added over the next couple of days. But you can certainly read the text of your remarks mm -hmm. from yesterday. So let's talk about some of the themes from that. It, it started with a, a drop the needle on various parts of the college's history, and without going through them all again, because people can read that or review it in a day or two, can you give us a sense of how much time you spent thinking about Williams' history and how that might have shaped your thinking to this point? Well, from the very beginning, I mean, even before I'd been named president, it was clear that to understand Williams, I had to understand the history. And so I've spent quite a bit of time since last September trying to educate myself. I've read books, I've talked to alumni, I talked to Fred Rudolph, who uh, knows more Williams history than anybody. And um, so as I was putting the, the talk together, I wanted to, to draw on those because I think understanding history is really the key to understanding our own understanding of ourselves. And I thought that was very important. Mm -hmm. And we're at a point in the college's history that's tricky in some ways. We're at the top of our game. And, and that what we do, people perceive, and we believe as well, is at such a high level, it's hard to go, know where to go next. At the same time, when there are economic limitations of a kind that we weren't experiencing until a few years ago. So could you th think al aloud a bit about that, how you take an institution that's already doing an awful lot very well, uh, take it to a place that maybe doesn't need as much money <laughs> as it used to <laughs> before? That's a tough situation yeah. to be in as a new president. I think that we're at a moment with the college that is not unlike a larger moment in our, in our country and in our society, where I think coming out of a decade where we had the opportunity to think expansively, to kind of basically ask the question, what new thing are we going to do? And how will we become something new or, or add something in the years to come? Which is a wonderfully fun question to ask and, and was quite appropriate to that time to a time when I think we're not in the presence of that particular opportunity. And rather, we have to, I think, turn back to asking ourselves what it is we really do and to look at the elements of that and make sure that we do them really well. And fortunately, I think we're a college that, that is able to have that conversation. Uh, I think we know, and I talked a lot about it in the, in the address, uh, coming back to the, the fundamentals of education and the fundamentals of the development of students. And that's actually fun work. So what do you think are their, our main challenges right now? And then I'm also going to ask about opportunities, but let's start yeah. with challenges. Well, I think that, uh, I'll name a couple of them. I think that one is an interesting challenge, which is how do we, as a small college, with you know, roughly you know, 250 faculty, roughly 2,000 students, and you, you work it out, a certain number of courses that we're going to be offered, a certain size to the catalog, that our catalog will be as long as we remain that size, which I fully expect we will. How do we think about a curriculum that addresses the kind of exploding um, number of things that one could reasonably want to study in, in a college? And that is, uh, we, 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 have a, we have a constraint that in a university situation you don't have. That is, in a university you can simply, you know, it's large, you can add more faculty, you, can, you have so many degrees of freedom that you can uh, kind of add new curriculum without having to think all the time about what it is you're not going to teach if you teach something new. Um, but 
we don't have that we don't have that opportunity we have to think carefully about our curricular choices and if you look at a history department for example where a generation ago you did European history and American history and a smattering of world history now that same department at that same size has to do all of that but thoroughly African history Atlantic history Latin American history certainly Asian history South Asian history uh, and then from any number of, of, of additional perspectives. So what do you do with that history department? I think it's a really interesting challenge and the kind of thing that, that our faculty are really going to enjoy and already grappling with, but I think really enjoy grappling with in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Any other challenges? Well, I think there's the challenge of, of, of making sure that we have a, uh, a really coherent and inclusive community. I think the, one of the great things that's happened at, maybe the greatest thing that's happened at Williams College in the last generation is its opening to the world and the diversity of the community. And by that I mean not just kind of racial diversity, but economic diversity, very international community. 20% um, of our students are, first, are coming in this freshman year, our first generation. This is a community of students that looks very different from the much more homogeneous community of a generation ago. So the challenge is that much greater of creating then here at the college a community which is not just a number of individual elements in parallel but, but adds up to a thing that's Williams. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we have work to do there. I, I think that it's a wonderful to be here. But uh, I think that we have to think differently about how we create community than for, I think, the vast majority of the college's history. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts yet on how that might happen or what the next steps might be or what even mm -hmm. the process might be for getting to a, a better place on that? Well, I think that it shows up in, I mean, this is a broad theme that shows up in individual issues. So the last year, the college had a very large conversation about its upper class residential system and the way room draw is done and the way that students are slotted into what we call neighborhoods. And a very, very thoughtful commission consisting of students and faculty and administration produced a very thoughtful report and recommended some changes. So I think part of what we're doing is we've implemented those changes, kind of loosened up the room draw. We're going to track that. We're going to see if that addresses the issues that were identified. And if it doesn't, we're going to go back and make some more changes. Uh, I'd like us to start looking at, at not just the upper class experience, but the experience of students in, in entries. And I think that's, again, the, the entry system is one that's been very successful for the college. But I'm concerned that it be successful for all students. Mm -hmm. And we're not, I'm not entirely, you know, many of us are not entirely persuaded that, that all students experience that entry system mm -hmm. in the same way. Yeah. So that's another piece to, to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, we have you know, wonderful athletics programs, but again, you hear uh, sometimes rumblings from students that the experience of athletes uh, and the experience of, of students who aren't varsity athletes uh, there's, there's, is not the same and that there's, um, if not a divide, a kind of different set of perceptions about what it is to be at Williams. I'd like us to think about that and address that. So I think it's, it's not a 30,000 foot, kind of, we have to find individual issues and, and work on them. Yeah. So before we get to the opportunities, let's go back a bit. You were referring to departments and everyone would like to teach more or, or different things or more deeply. But at the same time, there's a sense that two things. One, that small colleges are in a better position to have more synthetic ways of teaching and learning as opposed to just uh, yeah. by department and by discipline. And there are calls out there in the wider world that maybe the sun has set on the organization of academia based on departments, and I know you have some thoughts on that. Well, I, I, I think people have thought that departments were dead and disciplines were dead many times in, in history. And I think that, um, I won't think we're at a moment when that's the case at all. I think that we organize ourselves into departments because they do, departmental differences really are differences in, in modes of understanding the world. And a historian thinks differently about understanding the world than a sociologist or an anthropologist. What I do think is different now, and I think richer now in academia than ever before, is the kind of interdisciplinary work that, that goes on, the kind of conversations between um, historians and sociologists, say, and anthropologists. And at Williams, students have, many students do more than one major. And I think this is a way that, 
they understand, come to understand these different, simultaneously, these different ways of understanding the world. But I don't think this means that the disciplines are dead. That is, it's not some mushy in-between way of understanding the world that we're seeking, something that is you know, neither history nor, that it isn't anything. Um, rather, what students need to be able to do is to simultaneously apply the, the modes of understanding from disciplines that have different sorts of intellectual commitments. And I think that's very exciting. I think that's why many of our students do a number of majors, mm -hmm. is they're, they're looking for that. But what they're not looking for is something that, that's kind of in the middle and not of anything. Yeah. But a double major could be an attempt to synthesize, or it could just they keep those two or three majors completely yeah. separate, and they're thinking about biology one day and economics another day. So do you really think that places like Williams of our size, or Williams in particular, do more of this kind of you know, synthesizing things in students' intellectual lives and faculty lives, and, 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 and if so, can we do more of it somehow? Yeah. Well, the, I think there's two parts to that. I mean, first, let me just say that many double majors are quite different, and I think they're valuable in their own way because students who come out of Williams being able to think in two very different ways also bring something to the world that's, uh, that's terrific. I, in terms of what William, we can do at Williams that we can't do at other sorts of institutions, I think what we do have at a liberal arts college, and certainly at Williams, that is different from, you know, from larger places is a kind of, the faculty have to find ways to, because the faculty is a small faculty, they have to find ways to talk to each other collaboratively uh, in order when we engage with students. So there aren't, these departments aren't so large <laughs> that student, that faculty can kind of only look at, look, look at their teaching from the perspective of, uh, of their colleagues in, in their department. And we see this on the ground. We see fac fascinating faculty collaborations around teaching. Uh, Ed Berger in the Department of Mathematics has taught a course on creativity, which has been simultaneously about the humanities and the social sciences and the sciences. And I think that the commitment that the faculty have to innovative teaching naturally leads them to these kinds of synthetic moments in thinking about their craft. But again, the, the faculty who do that, do that coming out of particular disciplinary understandings and disciplinary training, disciplinary grounding, and I think that's what makes the work so powerful. Yeah. Okay, let's switch to opportunities then. What do you think our main one or two chances are to move ahead here? Well, I think that actually, to follow on what we were just saying, mm -hmm. I, I think we, we really have the finest teachers in America. I mean, I really believe that. Uh, the same, Ed Berger recently won the Ro Robert Foster Cherry Award for, terri for terrific undergraduate teaching. I think it's called something more formal than that. <laughs> this is given by Baylor to a single professor in the country. And it's a co big national competition. The finalists go down to Waco and give, give public lectures. And uh, no one, except for one college, <laughs> and again, it's universities that compete as well, has won this more than once. And Williams has won it three times. And uh, the two of them, uh, two of these faculty were from our mathematics department. So the Williams Mathematics Department has won more Robert Foster Cherry Awards than any university in the country. And the reason we do this so well is that our faculty are so committed to teaching. And I think we have an opportunity to really be national leaders. To, and, and when we think about you know, innovative teaching, we have a platform to to bring that to, to, to larger audiences outside of Williamstown. We're already doing that. We're in, an, we're in an, at a moment when I don't think, when I think we need some leadership in this country about teaching. And I think that we need to get back to thinking about teaching as a process that involves faculty and students and not merely dumping information into kids' heads. And I think we have a chance to show leadership there. I think that's very exciting for the college. Mm -hmm. So what form might that take? I, you, it's one thing to develop even stronger teaching than we already have here, but what might mechanisms be for you know, broadening the effect mm -hmm. of that outside Williamstown? Well, I think that our, our faculty are, um, are publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both publishing textbooks and publishing videos. Uh, there are professional associations where our faculty are very visible. Uh, I think another way in which our faculty are visible is through their scholarship. And the scholarship is actually not a separate pursuit from the teaching. So when a Susan Engel writes an article in the New York Times about testing, 
which he did recently. It was a wonderful article about kind of the role of testing in, in high schools. That's something that connects kind of directly back to the work that she does here at Williams with our students. And so again, by being out in the public sphere, uh, our, stu our, our faculty can kind of raise people's consciousness about the fact that scholarship and teaching are, are deeply intertwined as we believe that they are here at Williams. So it's being public about what we do. Uh, we can only teach 550 new kids a year. We bring in that many a year, 2,000 every year when we're, when we're at full strength. And so we can't do it by, uh, you know, making, we're not going to make Williams College more impactful by tripling its size. But we can get our faculty out, as they already are, into the world talking about what we do. So I'm going to reach across you here. <laughs> this piece of paper that has a couple <laughs> questions on it that people had sent in. And, and uh, the first one uh, begins with a quote from John Hennessy, who's president of Stanford. And the quote is from him. I worry that we have lost, not just at Stanford, but I think globally at many institutions, the notion of a classical liberal arts degree. In the end, an undergraduate education is, as I remind the freshmen, a foundation for life. It's just not just a key to your first job. So this questioner asks if you could give your response mm -hmm. to that, how you think that intersects with Williams. Well, I think the key sentence there is the, is the last one. That is, I'll say a little bit about you know, how one, I would think one might think about a classical liberal arts education. But I think the observation that Hennessy makes that in the, at the very end of that passage is that what you do is, is critical. That is, what you do between the ages of 18 and 22. Right? You're going to, you, know, you come out of, of a Williams or a Stanford, if, if you happen to be in John Hennessy's world, and you enter life, and that, you have 50 years or so of life. So you ask, what could those four years possibly be about? And if those four years are about collecting some kind of facts, um, by the time you're 30, if you're using those facts in your career, still, you, you're not doing anything very interesting with your life. And you know, certainly at Williams, we don't expect our students to be kind of recycling facts they learned at Williams a decade later, uh, nor, nor I imagine at Stanford. Um, so the four years must be about something else. So wh what is that about? Clearly, it's, it's about things that one thinks of immediately when we think of a liberal arts education. It's about learning to write. It's about learning to think critically about a wide variety of things. It's about learning to be numerate when you need to be numerate and understand, um, uh, when, the, when, the, understand when it is you need to be quantitative and when qu being quantitative is meaningful. Uh, you need to have some awareness of the wider world. And you need to understand where you know, your own society comes from. And I think that anyone who, who wants to talk about a liberal arts education would naturally be led to, to think of those elements and would argue, as I would, that those have incredible staying power. And that certainly when you're, if you can absorb that between the ages of 18 and 22, when you're 30 or 40 or 50, that will be continuing to make an, uh, an impact on your life. Now there's another debate, which I think is an extraordinarily interesting debate, that I actually don't feel I have a strong horse in right now, although I'm very interested in it. And that's the conversation about what exactly the structure of that education ought to be. And there have been some very interesting, provocative articles in the press about how, how uh, uh, regulated that should be. Should there be a core? Should there be a, a certain certain set of material related to, say, Western civilization or American history that every student ought to learn? And I think one of the great uh, strengths of American higher education is that you can find institutions with all sorts of philosophical positions on, on that question, from, from institutions where, where it's essentially all elective to institutions where that education is very prescriptive. And I think those are wonderful conversations. I'm not sure there's a right answer. I think very much for students, it's about finding the place that they're the most comfortable. Uh, but I'm glad that people are bothering to have that conversation and worry about that. Yeah. So I'm surprised in this quote from John Hennessy. He seems to be saying it's the institutions themselves that are losing this sense of the liberal arts. I, I don't think we think that's happening at Williams. I'd be surprised if it was happening at Stanford. But we do all believe that the w world more broadly is losing a sense of the importance of a yeah. liberal arts education. In particular, you know, certain populations that we're trying to attract to Williams, you know, uh, uh, first-generation college students, low-income, high-achieving students, minority yeah. students. So do you have that fear that it's not us who are, have lost the sense of this, but the world out there and what we might do about that? Well, I think that we're at a, there, there's several elements to that. I mean, 
I would say first that we're at a moment in the national conversation about higher education where I do think we've lost our way on, the, on this question. And I think that th there's a very understandable desire to make sure we spend our money well and we spend the time of our kids well. And I, I fully support that instinct and, and I think we do that at, at Williams. I think we look very hard at what we do. But when you then try to uniformly assess across all higher education, all institutions, whether we do that well, we're often brought to very narrow kind of instrumental uh, uh, ideas about what higher education is. Um, how many engineers do we train? Um, how many courses in this, that, or the other particular discipline are students taking? And that leads us, I think, to ask the wrong questions about what doing well really means. And uh, I think our students feed into this nationally because the anxieties about what kind of job am I going to get when I graduate are understandably very you know, prevalent in the minds of students and, and their parents. And so it leads, both of these forces kind of lead to a sense that higher education is about collecting a certain set of skills, uh, very na particularly narrow and skills that lead directly to employment. And you know, these seemingly practical kinds of considerations, uh, I think, drive us to a, to, to a vision of education that's very different from what I think Hennessy would advocate as, as a classical liberal arts education. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with training engineers. Um, there's nothing wrong with training undergraduate scientists or graduate scientists. I'm, I'm one myself. But the notion we would want to be careful of was that a good system of higher education is judged primarily by the number of engineers that it produces. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there are elements of our national conversation that, um, that, that seem to, to push us in that more narrow direction. Mm -hmm. And do you see that Williams has a responsibility mm -hmm. to push back against that? I think Williams has a very significant responsibility to push back against that. I think all the liberal arts colleges do. And uh, I think in our associations, uh, the Annapolis group, for example, is a group where liberal arts colleges college presidents get together and discuss issues that are of importance to us. I would like us to find a language and find an opportunity to, to make the case more broadly, not institution by institution, but, uh, but as a group with our colleagues that, certainly what I believe, that uh, a liberal arts education is more relevant th than it ever has been. I think that our philosophy at Williams is one that's certainly very productive for our students, which is that Many of our students go on and do incredibly technical things with their lives. And so one of our bicentennial medalists, Dan Kleppner, spoke eloquently. I mean, he's somebody who's, who I think is as distinguished a scientist as any that is alive in the United States today. And he spoke of the, at the, you know, what he was doing in his, in his late teens and early 20s here at Williams, not being just about physics, is what in fact made him the physicist that he went on to become. Uh, we train physics students, we train biology students, they go to the very best graduate programs and they become terrific scientists and engineers. But they do it with a Williams undergraduate education that doesn't try to teach them everything about their specialty in the first four years, but rather prepares their minds to, to do graduate work and to, to move in technical directions. Yeah. That, what you were just talking about ties into another question that, that an alumnus sent in. And I think behind this question is a, it's a sense that maybe we don't do enough to start preparing our students for high technology careers. So this person asks, you know, how you see the role of Williams and its alumni in a world economy driven increasingly by technology instead of traditional financial and industrial forces, and from a center of gravity in the U.S. and the West toward the Pacific Rim. So that's a double-barreled question, yeah. but embedded in both, I think, is a sense that technology is the key here, and shouldn't we be doing more to prepare more of our students for careers and lives in technology? Well, I think it's a terrific question. I mean, I think it's one I actually get, get often from, uh, from thoughtful alumni. I, I think, and there are various pieces to that, right? I think that um, whether we should be I don't know if I should, we'd say we should be doing more. I think we do quite a bit already. But I, I would like to raise the, the, the visibility of, of science and technology among the students and among students who are thinking of coming to a Williams. And actually among our alumni as well. I think that many of our students who graduate here with uh, technical majors 
uh, say a computer science major, may not have taken as many computer science courses as somebody who, as a kid who graduates from MIT, but uh, they are, I think, every bit as well equipped to go out into the computer science industry in the Silicon Valley and, and make terrific contributions. There's no doubt that you know, the first three months after, your, after you graduate, uh, the exact position that you have in an industry is going to depend quite a bit on the particular set of courses that you happen to take. But I think the decay, the time over which that difference decays is relatively rapid. And what I would ask is that our alumni who are out in the kind of the technical industries take a really good look at our students and what they bring and think of hiring our students not as one or two year investments but as long term investments. Because I think our alumni actually know that they've made long term investments in their own career and they know what the Williams part of their learning <laughs> did to set them up for everything that they've done. And so I'd ask them to kind of come to us and, and look to our students for, for people who will not just be great for two years, but will be great for 10 and 20 years. All right. So there are ways in which some people, especially parents, think that a student goes to college in order to get a good job. Yeah. We see it as you go to college to get a great right. life, you know, and that's the difference between a liberal arts approach and a more uh, narrow pre preparation for a career approach, which leads to the broader idea of, of why Williams exists in the first place, which is not just to provide a private good, yeah to individual students, which does accrue to them when they come to a place like at Williams, um, but, to, but to generate a public good. And you talked about that in your address yesterday. I think it's worth maybe expanding on a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, as I said in the address, I think what that means has really changed over, over the last 200 years. I, we are a, you know, we're a college chartered in Massachusetts um, by the state of Massachusetts given privileges such as not paying taxes <laughs> that we are given because we're expected to contribute to this state and to this country. And uh, I think it is, you know, from the very origins of, the, of, of, of the, the college, as important to contribute as it is to kind of narrowly think of ourselves as educating a group of students. Um, so the, the ways in which we do that have evolved. I think we've always produced leaders. I think one of the great uh, evolutions of the college over the last uh, generation is that the, well, who we have come to think of as the potential leaders of this country that we want to educate has broadened in ways to, to really embrace you know, all of the parts of our country and increasingly parts of our world. So if our, if our, the way we are going to provide a public good is to provide people, is to produce graduates who will do great things for the world. Uh, I think we've evolved to the point that we, we understand that, that that involves being very open to the world and, and bringing such a wide variety of students yeah. here. Let's talk a bit about internationalization. So that alumnus's uh, question, the second bit about the Pacific Rim, raises this issue that's of course an important one for all of higher education, including Williams, the degree to which we are an international institution as opposed to whatever we were before yeah. that, one grounded right here in, in Berkshire County. And, could you expand on that idea a little bit too? How can we become an international institution in this particular place that we find ourselves? Well, I think I think we have. That's the paradox, right? That we're in a particular place, and it's a uh, it's a little valley uh, that that's not the easiest thing to get to. There's no no international airport within half an hour, so we have to be much more creative, I think, than than many of our peers in terms of thinking about what that means. Now, there are some obvious pieces to that, right? That we we have. Uh, a uh, significant number of students from from around the world who come here, and they, you know, that part of what that's about is is kind of extending the benefits of a Williams education to the world. But an equally important part of what that's about is making the campus one that is alive with international perspectives, and our international students bring an enormous amount to 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 the college environment. We send our students abroad to do to do study abroad, and we of course done that for a long time, and everybody does that. I think that. Um, it's not a. Uh, it's not something that's necessarily for everybody. I, I feel strongly that study abroad experiences should have the qualities of being immersive in some really meaningful sense, and so they become true, uh, uh, hopefully somewhat uncomfortable, novel cultural experiences and academic rigor. I think those are the two elements that we need to see in every study abroad program 
the opportunity cost of losing a semester or a year at Williams is actually, I think what we students get here is pretty terrific. And so if you're not going to have that, what you get instead has to be very meaningful. So I think we need to make sure that that's the case of what we're doing with all of our study abroad programs. But those two pieces are, are kind of very old. I think that we have to infuse our curriculum with international perspectives. I think it, it's there in, in, in many fields in which you know, people might be surprised to, to, to discover that it is. But we ought to think about how to make that coherent and how to kind of uh, how to understand that better. Uh, and I think we ought to find ways to get students into international contexts outside of the traditional kind of one semester or one year study abroad program, winter study program, summer programs. Our faculty are, I think, keen to lead these kinds of programs. And every time we present an opportunity, we find many faculty who would like to do this. And again, have intensive, immersive, academically rigorous experiences with our students in winter study and in the summers. So I don't think being international is primarily, should be thought of as a way of getting out of Williamstown. I think it has to happen in Williamstown. But it also does have to, uh, has to happen in ways that, that take advantage of the particular opportunities that we have here. Right. I think another way in which we're trying to prepare students for the world they're going to enter is a heightened degree of environmental awareness and the impact of their own consumption, and that means the college's own <laughs> consumption and greenhouse gas emissions and all that. And in particularly at a time when money has gotten tighter, what thoughts might you have on the importance of that for Williams and the ways we go about trying to deliver better than so far we've been able to in, in terms of controlling greenhouse gas emissions and general sustainability? Again, I think there are, there are two pieces to that. I mean, first, it's a long-term commitment, and the college made a significant commitment to become more sustainable um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago before I, before I got here. Uh, and I think it is an ongoing process to, to figure out exactly what that commitment means and, and how we're going to live it. So you know, the new buildings that we build have, are certified to be sustainable buildings. Uh, we're very conscious of our greenhouse gas emissions and we have ambitious targets over time that, that, I, that I fully expect that we're going to meet. I think, the, but many of these are kind of technological back office, as it were, kinds of uh, uh, approaches to becoming more sustainable. I think what's harder, and I think involves a lot of campus conversation, are the ways in which we're actually going to change our behavior. And everything from how much paper we allow everybody to print to uh, the ways in which we use energy in the residence facilities. Uh, th these are, I think, where the rubber meets the road on whether you're you're really going to become more sustainable or not. You can pick the low-hanging fruit and do the things that nobody notices, but, uh, but when, we start the, when we start to make real choices about uh, where our food comes from and our energy comes from and uh, how much we travel, we have to, that's where we're going to really understand what that commitment means. We have to meet this commitment in a way that doesn't subvert the purposes of the college. And we, we, we're committed to being sustainable, but it doesn't trump you know, every choice we make, we have to be careful that this, the commitment to sustainability doesn't trump other desiderata. <laughs> and we want our students to study abroad, and uh, that uses carbon. But I think that the investment in an airplane trip to Africa for a student to spend a semester in South Africa is an investment that I think the college and we all ought to be making in the, the life of that student. So I don't think there are easy answers to these questions. but. Uh, I think we are now in a position of having a college conversation about what living this commitment to sustainability really means. The other element to it is to simply raise students' consciousness about the choices that they make. So and that's part of just being a liberal arts college, but that's a dimension that's, I think, much stronger than it used to be. Uh, we want students to go out in the world and understand that there are consequences to the choices they make. And uh, so there's an educational component to the sustainability commitment, not just an operational component. So speaking of investments the college is making or, or contemplating making, there are two capital projects that were put on hold for a while when the economy went south. So let's talk a bit about them. The first one is the library project. So if you could tell us again the, the, the why of that and the, and, and the wherefore of it before I get down to any particulars about it. So the library project, I think, is an extraordinarily exciting project and one that uh, I became aware of when I first came to the campus in, in the spring. It is, in fact, the final phase on a multi-part project to you know, completely reconceptualize the northern part of the campus, which is where many of the Division I and Division II faculty 
do their work and students do their work with them. Uh, the first two phases in this were uh, Hollander and Shapiro Halls, which are new academic buildings, which are absolutely marvelous pieces of architecture, but in fact exciting to me for other reasons, I think even more so. Uh, they're meant to be academic crossroads where uh, students can come see their faculty and then linger, linger with each other to, to come across faculty in informal ways. The, the offices the faculty have are large enough to teach a tutorial in, uh, and it's kind of, a, again, not to take us far afield from the, the question of the library, which I'm going to come to, but, the, the, but I think it's critical because it, it, th these are spaces which are designed kind of in view of the kind of ways we bring to people, students together and faculty together around teaching. There are lounges where students will come and, and, and work together near the faculty, run into them. So they are live, you know, breathing, living, uh, exciting places to be, these two new academic buildings. And what had always been conceived was a third element of that, which was to build a new modern library behind Stetson Hall, to renovate Stetson Hall, and then to, once we have this new library, uh, to create where the existing Sawyer Library is, kind of a marvelous quadrangle. And I'll say, of course, if you want to know what the library is about, but kind of starting kind of at 30,000 feet, what this will then be is a precinct for Divisions 1 and 2. The library, again, is, is conceived of, and I think brilliantly executed in its plans, as an academic crossroads. Uh, there will be books in the library. In fact, I have to say in defense of books, that uh, circulation of books last year went up 9% in the library. Books are not dead. Books are a wonderful storage and retrieval medium, and we have a lot stored in them, and students use them, they, they want to be around them, and they will for a generation. But it is, is not a library dominated by its books. Uh, the, the, there's a part of the library that will have the stacks and a lot of compact shelving and extensive use of an off-site facility, so the books will stay confined to, to the book area. But around the books and in the other parts of the library, you know, terrific numbers of group study spaces, some individual study spaces to be sure, but, but tables and, and, and group study rooms and, and technology that will allow students to continue to, to study together. If you look at the balance of seating, for example, in the old Sawyer Library and the new Stetson, uh, in, the, in the existing Sawyer Library, almost all of the seating is individual carols. There's very little space for collaboration, very little space for interdisciplinary work involving numbers of students, very little space for faculty and students to work together, no room for technology, no way to compactify the shelving, actually, to make more room for people in, in that library. Um, if we go over to the new Stetson, it is the, the seating is dominated by group study spaces of various kinds. And that reflects the ways our students want to work together, the way they do work together in the SCAL library now. If you want to know what the Stetson Library is going to be like in terms of what it will feel like to be in there, walk into SCAL and you're just packed to the gills with students uh, working together and working alone with each other, which I think is, is, is something that, that students also want to do. So the new Sawyer is conceived with a kind of a primacy a uh, primary priority is fostering the interaction of students with each other and with faculty. Uh, there's the Center for Media, new Center for Media Initiatives will collect a lot of our kind of most in, most interesting kind of technological uh, approaches to teaching and learning. The special collections and the Chapin Library will be given prominent place in the old renovated Stetson and in the new Sawyer. And to say a word about that too, I found that nothing excites students more than spending time with original, historical, uh, old <laughs> materials. And I think in these days when, when it's easy to feel that everything is ephemeral and, and knowledge kind of winks in and out of existence, when students sit down with a book that's 300 years old, uh, I think they get a very different sense of, of how knowledge is created and transmitted. Uh, and I'm very excited that you know, on the floor next to the floor where we'll have the most modern technology we will have the oldest books in our collection. And for students to be able to move between those two worlds, I think it's going to be transformative for them. So it's an enormously exciting project. And the college put it on hold uh, when, the, the kind of the, when the economic crisis that put a lot of things on hold uh, hit. 
And it's really my highest priority to, to find a way to, to move that project forward. I think it's time is now. It is an incredibly forward-looking library project. So it sounded like you might have wanted to say more about tutorials. Yeah. Did you, do you want to do that now? <laughs> I would love to do that now. Um, I think that the tutorials are, along with you know, the, the, the opening of the, the, the college to, um, to uh, such a diverse set of students, along with that you know, great advance, they are the other great advance of Williams College over the last generation. And the, the institution of the tutorials and then the initiative that President Shapiro took to expand that system, uh, to make it available to, to more students and for students to do more of them in the last decade has just transformed the academic experience of students at Williams. Uh, it is the, it's the Mark Hopkins on a log experience. And uh, you know, James Garfield was right when he characterized uh, education or the kind of perfect education that way. It is the interaction, the intimate interaction between a faculty member and a student, or the way we run them, a faculty member and two students, which I think is actually an even richer way to do it because we then have the interaction of the students that, that with each other as a the piece of that. Students report that you know, again and again when they graduate, you ask them, what was the singular academic experience you had at Williams? And they will say, they'll point to a tutorial that they had. Because they had that opportunity to be so uh, directly working with faculty and with each other. So you were at the football game yesterday. Aaron Kelton, new head coach's first game and first win, of course. Um, so let's talk about the Weston Project and yeah. the idea behind it and where that is now. So the, the Weston Project is a project to kind of deal with some of the issues that we have with uh, Weston Field. Um, I was in the stands for the first time, and, and I, you know, I, the, these stands are, uh, I, I was watching my kids carefully as they crawled around the stands. I mean, they're, 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 I think they're perfectly fine, but they, uh, they do have a lot of open space down there underneath them. Uh, I think what's important is to deal with some kind of deficiencies with the, with the track, and we put a new surface on the track, and we'll probably need to do that again. I, I think, so we had some thinking about that, and one of the things that I asked us to do when I came was to kind of rethink what our thinking was. Um, I think that it's really important that we conceive of whatever we do down there as being broadly about uh, athletics, uh, about certainly we need a, a good place to play football games, but uh, that's an opportunity there to serve many sports, to serve uh, not just varsity sports, but recreational sports. And if we're going to redo the, the field complex down at the end of Spring Street, I think we have to seize the opportunity to make it as broadly, that project as broadly impactful as we possibly can, not just to solve some problems with all that empty space underneath the stands. So since, again, the, the economy had given us the opportunity to uh, not move it forward <laughs> right, right at the moment we thought we might, uh, we thought we would seize that opportunity to try to rethink the whole thing and make sure that we were doing the absolute most str strategic thing that we could down there at the end of Spring Street. Mm -hmm. So when you started getting to know Williams a year plus ago, um, were you surprised at all by the, the role of athletics here? And how have you come to understand that? Well, obviously we're very proud at Williams of how well our teams do. And it's a lot of fun to win the Director's Cup every year. Uh, but from the very beginning, in fact, I talked to the search committee and the trustees and, and, and Harry Sheehy, who's our marvelous director of athletics, who uh, Dartmouth is now very, very lucky to have as theirs, about whether the point was to win the Director's Cup. And so, you know, you know, the Director's Cup is given by the NCAA for the most successful program in each division, and we've won it, I think, 14 out of 15 years. And what everyone said was certainly consonant with what I believe, is that it's not. That's not the end, that's not the end of having a strong athletics program. Um, if you count the varsity athletes and uh, junior varsity athletes and club sports and, and recreation athletics, you know, by far the majority of our students are active. And being, you know, as going all the way back to Mark Hopkins, it was, was recognized that that is as critical an element of the development of young people as the development of their minds in the classroom. Uh, Varsity athletics in particular gives an opportunity to be part of a structured team, to represent the college, uh, to, to be visible, to, to 
uh, there's a lot that's required of student athletes in terms of their uh, commitment to their sports and the time commitments and and you know they're asked to, to, to balance some things that I think learning to make those balances uh, those choices is something that serves them very well in their lives and so we're proud I mean I'm proud of our athletics programs not because we win although that's fun but because we I think build um, better graduates graduates better equipped to to take on the world and be effective in it uh, often when those students have the opportunity for serious athletic endeavor when we hire coaches we make sure that these are coach that the coaches we hire and again when ha uh, Harry she he was uh, director of athletics you know I, I know this was his priority because he and I talked about it quite a bit coaches who see themselves primarily as the developers of young men and women uh, and that Harry felt and I feel and I know our next athletic director will feel that if we do that if our coaches are focused on our student athletes as people and not just as athletes who happen to be students we're actually going to win more <laughs> And, uh, and that's, we've been borne out by that. So I'm very pleased with the role that athletics plays at Williams. I think it's healthy. I think that we're focused on the right things. I think our student athletes have terrific experiences and come out as, as terrific graduates whose athletic experiences very often uh, have informed deeply the people that they are going to become. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking mostly about activities on campus, but let's think for a while about alumni and parents. And what role or roles do you think they have to play in the experience that our students do have here? Well, let me start with the parents. Um, be very hard to have students uh, if their parents weren't uh, showing us the confidence of allowing us to have their children for four years. And I have to say that, and I met 550, haven't quite met them all, but <laughs> met many of our 550 freshmen uh, in the last few weeks. And they must have some terrific parents because kids that are that terrific uh, come from somewhere. Uh, and the parents have a critical role to play in the ways that they support their students, their kids, as they are here at Williams, gradually letting go, letting their students solve their own problems, make their own way here. And it's kind of marvelous not only to see the way that students evolve from when uh, they are dropped off as freshly scrubbed 18-year-olds and parents kind of not wanting to let them go, it's wonderful to see how the students evolve. It's also wonderful to see how the relationships between the students and their parents evolve until the parents come back kind of amazed by uh, who, their, who their children have become. So the support of parents of the college and of their children are both those are just critical elements to, to everything we do. The alumni, there are 27,000 alumni, and uh, they're a force. I mean, the, the Williams alumni are uh, famously loyal to the college and they have a lot to be loyal about as, as I've learned. I'm, it's my regret that I'm not, that I'm not uh, uh, among them. Uh, and of course the, I think the, the most important thing that Williams alumni do is to, is to continue to be in contact with each other and to raise the consciousness of a Williams College in, in, in the country to help us recruit students, to help us place our students in the world when they graduate, to help each other uh, make their way in the world. Uh, the kind of the autonomy of the, the Alumni Association chapters, I mean, some 70 of them, I was trying to think how long it would take me to visit them all, which I, uh, take me quite a while. Um, these are kind of, many of them, you know, self, almost self-organizing groups of Williams alumni just brought together by the love of their college, but then able to, 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 to help each other be effective in life and not just look backwards, but to look forwards together. And of course, the financial help that the alumni provide the college has been critical since 1821. We simply would not be Williams without the uh, resources that the college has. And those resources came from our alumni. So uh, Williams simply wouldn't be Williams without the alumni. And I must say, finally, that uh, they've been remarkably welcoming to me. It's really been one of the extraordinarily gratifying uh, elements of becoming president is how welcoming the alumni have been uh, and how, uh, even though I, I, I wasn't born purple, everyone's giving me the chance to become purple quickly. Mm -hmm. That's great. So are you worried about anything? Oh, I'm worried about a lot of things. <laughs> but um, I think that we have challenges that, uh, that, that I think we can meet. Look, the world is very uncertain. Right? We're at a moment when 
Uh, we've come through a difficult economic time, and we may well have another difficult economic time. And I think we have to become, and I worry about that, <laughs> Uh, we have a mission, and when the world makes it hard, the conditions of the world make it hard to fulfill that mission, it's the job of the president to be worried. I think that much of what I talked about at the beginning, about using this moment as a time to become focused on our highest priorities, our most core sense of, of who we are and what we do, uh, we have to take this moment so that you know, when, again, resources become tight, we will know what we're doing. And uh, this conversation that we're having about what is core at Williams, what really makes us uh, Williams, which I think is at its heart, this interaction between faculty and student. Uh, this, inter this conversation, will, if we have it well, will serve us well when we face material challenges in the future. And I worry about these, these, these questions of our community. That is, I, I, th I raise them, again, not because I think we don't know how to face them, but because we have to face them. You know, we, we have to, 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 to make sure over this next five or 10 years that, that our community does not kind of fracture, or fracture would be too strong a word, that we don't somehow become a set of parallel communities, that each of which you know, enjoys Williams, uh, enjoys each other, but, does, but isn't, isn't part of a whole that we can all understand. And, and I, I worry about us being able to do that, mm -hmm. but I think we will. And in terms of costs, which you were just mentioning, the one cost of ours that's going up much more than any others is financial aid. Do you worry about the cost of financial aid? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I, we have a commitment, which I think is uh, uh, at the heart of what, of what we aspire to, which is to admit students um, irregardless of their, regardless of their financial circumstances. That's called need-blind admissions. And then meet their need fully. Um, and that's uh, something we do. I think we have generous financial aid. It really is possible for, uh, for every student who uh, can benefit from a Williams education, who we admit to, to come here. But you know, financial aid is counter-cyclical. <laughs> as, uh, as you go to an economic downturn, uh, as we most recently saw, the resources available for financial aid, much of financial aid supported by endowment, go down at the very time that the demand on our financial aid goes up. And so, uh, and, and so I think all of us in higher education worry about the ability to, to how are we going to continue to afford this commitment, which is, again, such an essential commitment for, for us. So we're getting near the end of our, t our time here, so let me shift a bit. Are you having any fun? I'm having a blast. Uh, Williams is a marvelous place, and Williamstown is a, is a fabulous community. Uh, my family is with me now. As soon as school let out in Baltimore, we're able to all move up, and that's a lot more fun than commuting from commuting up back and forth between here and Baltimore. And we really enjoy the summer. We get out in the mountains. I particularly enjoy that. Uh, my youngest son loves hiking, so we've gone, my eight-year-old, and we've gone up to, to, to Stony Ledge and kind of in anticipation of Mountain Day. Uh, and more generally, just exploring the Berkshires has been tremendous fun for us. We lived in kind of an urban, suburban you know, area before, and that was full of its own kinds of pleasures. But being able to, to get out to farms and buy local produce after a five-minute drive is, is a kind of pleasure that's really new to us. So. You know, the, what's magical about this, about Williams and Williamstown, is that it's kind of simultaneously rural and sophisticated and interesting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're enjoying both ends of that. Well, we're actually out of time, believe it or not, which went by quickly for mm -hmm. me. But, you know, especially on such a busy weekend for you, thanks for taking time to talk to mm -hmm. people and remind people who are viewing or, or listening that to go to the website, you'll be able to see over the next couple of days more of the, what's been happening this weekend, including some excerpts of this. So thanks again. Well, thank you, Jim. It was a lot of fun.